Okay, welcome everyone um, to our author visit. Uh, today we have Rob Zaleski, who wrote the book Edgarvey, Unvarnished, Lessons from a, a Visionary Progressive. Ed uh, is also has, is a journalist and he's worked at the Cap Times and was a UPI for United Press International and also a very new newspaper uh, called the Green Bay Gazette. And that's at the time where he first met Ed Garvey. Um, he, his book, Ed Garvey Unvarnished, was uh, given recognition by the editor of the Progressive Magazine uh, and they, he called it one of the best books of 2019. So without any more introduction, please welcome Ed Garvey. Uh, Rob Zaleski. <laughs> I've got Ed Garvey on my mind. Sorry about that. That's uh, okay. Uh, greetings and uh, thank you for joining me today on, and giving me the opportunity to talk about my book on Ed Garvey. Uh, I actually enjoyed preparing for this presentation it, uh, after spending the last week still trying to figure out why the Packers kicked a field goal rather than go with the golden arm of Aaron Rodgers. So this was a, a, a nice change of pace for me. I thought I would begin by uh, talking, out, talking about the long and crazy path that I took in getting this book published. Um, I've given several book talks over the last year and a half, and most people at these book talks seem to enjoy that story as much as they enjoyed the book about Ed Garvey itself. It is a, it is a pretty crazy story. So uh, I'll begin there. I'll start at the beginning, how I met Ed Garvey, and that kind of uh, will give you an, an idea on why I decided to pursue this book. In the early 1970s, I was the young, brash sports editor of, of a daily newspaper, a feisty small daily newspaper in Green Bay called the Green Bay Daily News. It was started by striking printers from the established newspaper in town, the Green Bay Press Gazette. Um, and Garvey, at that time, Ed Garvey was the brash, young, uh, a Serbic new uh, executive director of the National Football League Players Association. Uh, he was known at that time as one of the most despised men in America. I believe Time Magazine referred to him as that. And uh, the reason for that is that most people in America at that time, especially sports fans, thought it was ludicrous that uh, athletes like pro football players should uh, be allowed to make big salaries. Uh, and they were outraged that, that these athletes were being paid big money or wanted to make big money for what was essentially a kid's game. That, that was the argument nationwide. Uh, the surveys at that time overwhelmingly were against the union. And uh, Garvey, as I said, was very despised. He was, uh, and he relished the challenge. He really did. Uh, he took on the owners. He was fearless. Anyway, in the spring of 1974, as I was sports editor of this of this small feisty daily, um, the the NFLPA, the the players' union, they were threatening to go out on strike, which really angered sports people, sports fans across the country. They thought it was an outrage. And uh, right in the at the time, by the way. Uh, the average salary in the National Football League in 1974 was about 24000 if you can believe that. When the Packers won the Super Bowl, their first Super Bowl, Bart Starr, the quarterback, was their highest paid player. I believe he, he made $30,000. So anyway, enter Garvey, and uh, he's arguing that the players, the players were the game. Why should the owners make all this money? When the players were putting their bodies and their brains on the line to play football. Um, so the players, they were, they were threatening to strike. It was early 1974. It was the spring of 1974. And John Finkler, my assistant at the Daily News, came to me one afternoon. He rushed over to my desk and he said, you are not going to believe 
who I just got off the phone with, Ed Garvey. I said, Ed Garvey called the Daily News. Why would Ed Garvey, uh, why would he want to call the Daily News? And Finkler said, well, he seems to understand that most newspapers in the country are completely against the union. Uh, they hate the union. They hate Ed Garvey. So he called us and guess what? The players are going to strike. Garvey gave us the scoop. It's our story alone. It's our exclusive. Garvey gave me all the details. The only condition was that we did not reveal that it was Ed Garvey who was giving us this information. So here we are, this small daily in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I think our circulation was 12,000. The Press Gazette's circulation was about 48,000. And we print this scoop, banner headline, and the wire services pick up the story and we are on cloud nine. Uh, the story is picked up by the UPI and AP. It goes nationwide. And uh, over the next two years, Garvey would call us on a fairly regular basis. I would talk to him, but it was usually John Finkler who later ended up at the UW Athletic Department. And Garvey would give us scoop after scoop after scoop. And quite frankly, it, it here's our small newspaper, but it put us on the map, it gave us a certain degree of credibility. I do remember at one point during this whole situation, Bill Dwyer, who was my mentor, he was sports editor of the Milwaukee Journal. He called me one afternoon and said, my God, where in the, where in the heck are you guys getting these stories? Of course, I wasn't about to tell him that Garvey himself was calling us from Washington, DC, but that put us on the map. And that's how I met Ed Garvey. So fast forward, a decade, I became sports editor of the Green of the uh, Capital Times here in Madison, and then became a news columnist. Garvey uh, stepped down as head of the Players Union and came to Madison to become assistant attorney general under Bronson LaFollette. And a couple of years after that, he ran for office against conservative Republican Bob Kasten. It was a bitter, bitter race. Garvey lost. Uh, I can get into that a little later. Uh, a few years later, 1998, Garvey ran for governor against Tommy Thompson. He knew he couldn't, he wasn't about to win that race. I think he was outspent 10 to one. And then after he lost that race, he uh, established an environmental law firm in town, which won several significant environmental victories in the early 2000s that were just unbelievable, quite frankly. During that period, from the time he came back to Madison until the mid 2000s, I interviewed Garvey perhaps a dozen times uh, on a variety of issues. We were not friends. Uh, I uh, had this rule um, that I would never, um, never associate with people I wrote about. It was a a rule that I believed in, some of my colleagues did not, but I never socialized with anyone I wrote about. So I respected Garvey and uh, greatly admired him, but um, we weren't friends. And a lot of people have asked me, so what was it about Ed Garvey that you found so fascinating? And why did you hold him in such high regard? And I would say the reasons were, um, first of all, he was brutally honest. Here was a politician who never lied or rarely lied. In the times I dealt with him, he never lied. Think about how refreshing that would be in today's day and age. A politician who doesn't lie, who just basically, as the cliche goes, tells it like it is. That was Garvey. Um, he also was uh, brutally honest. Uh, beyond being brutally honest, he was very witty. Garvey could have been a late night talk show host. He was one of the funniest people I ever met, quite quite frankly. And uh, you couldn't help but laugh when you were interviewing him because he had so many one-liners. He was brutally sarcastic, but he, he was just fun to be around. The other thing is he was, he was genuine. Uh, I've met few people in my life, especially public figures who were as genuine as Ed Garvey. He, he was accessible. He had a huge ego, of course, but he had no airs about him. And uh, 
he really uh, related to and identified with uh, the average the average person out there. People, he, he could be in a public space and someone would walk up to him and want to get into a conversation and Ed would join the conversation and talk to that person for 15 or 20 minutes. I really respected that. I guess the other thing where I really respected him is that in the time that I got to know Ed Garvey, he always made his decisions based on what was right or wrong. Not on what the political polls showed, not on what consultants told him. Garvey did what he thought was right. And uh, gosh, imagine how, how different that is from what the politicians are like today. He did what he felt was right and wrong, right or wrong. So for instance, yes, he was brutal on Republicans. He, um, he opposed everything they stood for. But he also attacked Democrats. In my book, uh, he was livid. He greatly admired Barack Obama, but he was absolutely livid that Barack Obama never came to Madison during the 2010 protests on the square. Uh, or that no one from Barack Obama's administration came. Biden didn't come. No one. I mean, no top name Democrats. John Kerry wasn't here. You, you go down the list. And that was to to Garvey was a classic example of how the Democratic Party had lost its soul. He said to me in the interviews, my God, if Democrats can't identify with labor, uh, labor, which used to be one of their top constituents, one of their most important constituencies, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the party needs to be reformed dramatically. Um, and Garvey uh, thought, actually thought, as he goes into great length uh, in one of the chapters in my book, he thought he thought the uh, protests on the square, the one day where over 100,000 people came, he thought that was the beginning of the uh, reconstruction of the Democratic Party. He honestly thought the party had turned a corner, that uh, firefighters were there, teachers, uh, police, uh, average workers fighting for their rights. They didn't want to be crushed by Scott Walker. Uh, who was out to, of course, to destroy the um, public employee unions. So God, that was Garvey, and gosh, I admired that. He um, he said what he thought was right. He did what he his decisions were based on what he thought was right and wrong. I thought that was so unusual. So anyway, um, so I interviewed Garvey, like I said, perhaps a dozen times during that period. And this is where it gets interesting and the story gets pretty crazy. I was downsized out of my job with the Capital Times in 2008. Um, and Garvey, at around the same time, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He was still very sharp mentally, but uh, he knew he was, uh, he was about to become ill. It was gonna be a long, slow, slog, but he, he realized his days were numbered. In 2010, Scott Walker became governor. I was demoralized by just like tens of thousands of other progressives across the strait. I couldn't believe it. I was even more shocked and troubled by the fact that Russ Feingold had lost by over 100,000 votes to this odd, uh, strange, um, businessman from the Fox Valley named Ron Johnson. I could not believe that. It, it still doesn't make sense to me. So I happened to be driving through the UW Arboretum uh, several weeks after Scott Walker lost and happened to hear Garvey being interviewed on public radio. And of course, he was incensed by what happened and trying to make sense of it. And the thought occurred to me, a, a light bulb flashed in my brain. And I thought, my God, my God, maybe Garvey and I could collaborate on a book, um, uh, a book that would give hope to demoralized souls like me and um, maybe come up with a rough blueprint of how the, how the Democratic Party could uh, get back to its bearings and give hope to, uh, to the party regulars who remembered what the party was before it started tapping into big money special interests and corporations in the 1980s and, and basically became pretty much uh, much like the uh, Republicans, which is why Garvey was so upset with the Democratic Party. 
anyway, I proposed, I called Garvey on a whim and I proposed that we get together for lunch and we got together for lunch and I gave him, I proposed my idea for a book and Garvey, much to my surprise said, let's do it. When do you want to start? So we started meeting in February of 2011. We had 17 no holds barred interviews at his beautiful home on top of a hill in Shorewood Hills. We met for about an hour, hour and a half for those 17 interviews. Garvey understood from the start that I wasn't about to write a puff piece, a puff piece book on him. Uh, I wasn't about to anoint him to safehood, uh, sainthood. I, was, I wanted to do an objective appraisal, if you will, a question and answer uh, session, similar maybe to a 60 minutes interview or the old Playboy magazine interviews. Uh, that would uh, not only capture his persona, but also give him an opportunity to talk about the burning issues of the day. So we did, we did just that. For six months, we would meet regularly at his house. And we had these interviews, which quite frankly, I found fascinated, fascinating. I, I felt privileged. The more I got to know Ed Garvey, I began to realize what an amazing guy he really was. I had no idea, for instance, that he was involved in the early civil rights movement in the 1960s, that he had met uh, Martin Luther King and met Bobby, Bobby uh, Kennedy. Fascinating six months. But here's again, where it gets really crazy and that my colleagues, my journalist colleagues still give me heat about, razz me about. In our last interview, Garvey and I met in June in the sunroom of his, in his backyard, uh, off next to the backyard. And Garvey revealed to me in that last interview that he was also doing a book that was exclusively about his days with the National Football League, the union. Uh, that shocked me. I had no idea he was doing this book. I guess he had mentioned it vaguely in the beginning of our interviews. And after thinking about it for some time, I said to Ed, gosh, uh, you know what? That book is more, is more promising than this one. This one's probably a regional book that we're doing. Uh, your book that you're doing about your NFL days, that's a, that's a national book. And as colorful and widely known as you are, Ed, uh, I don't think there's a market for two books on Ed Garvey. So uh, I'm disappointed to say this, but I think I'm going to back off on writing I enjoyed our interviews. I happened to be writing a novel at the time called Searching for Sal, which came out in 2013. And uh, I set the interviews with Ed Garvey aside and went on to other things. When I told this to my journalist colleagues, they were aghast. They, they couldn't believe that I was actually going to spend six months with Ed Garvey, this visionary progressive, and that I wasn't going to do anything with it. But I honestly didn't think there were two books. Uh, there, were, there, there was a market for two books on Ed Garvey. So that was in 2011. Ed was very disappointed, of course, but he did understand. Four years later in 2015, um, I was working on other things uh, as a freelance writer. And uh, quite frankly, I got tired of opening up my laptop every day and seeing these interviews with Ed Garvey there. So I did another really stupid thing in retrospect. I deleted all of our interviews from my files. I deleted them because uh, I got tired of looking at them. And when I shared that with my journalist friends, they really thought I had gone off the deep end. They said, really? You, you know, you had six months with one of the most widely respected progressives to come out of this area and you just tossed the you deleted the interview files. And I said, yeah, I just, I just needed to do that. I felt this need to do that. So now two years later, 2017, my wife and I were vacationing in uh, Zihuatanejo, Mexico. And uh, I got a email from a friend of mine at the Cap Times, Samara Kalk, who told me that Ed Garvey had died of Parkinson's. Um, I wasn't able to go to his funeral, but over the next couple of weeks, uh, I noticed that there were glowing tributes to Ed Garvey from all over the country. The New York Times did a long obit. Uh, 
the NFL Players Association put a video on about what he had meant to their organization. There were numerous, numerous tributes. And that's when I realized I really had done a very stupid thing by uh, deleting all those interviews that we had. So I call, uh, I got back to Madison and, and I, in kind of a, I was kind of panicky and I contacted a IT friend of mine at the University of Wisconsin. He's one of the best, his name is Jim Hermanson. And I told him what I had done. And I said, do you think there's any chance that I could retrieve those interviews from my laptop? And he said, when did you delete them? I said, about two and a half years ago. He said, wow, not very likely. So I said, could you at least come over to our house and try? And so Jim came over and went into our study. My wife, Cindy and I were having dinner and Jim came in and he said, oh my God, I've got great news for you. I've retrieved every one of those interviews. They're intact. So I of course was very relieved and uh, assured my journalist friends that I wasn't gonna do anything, more, anything any more stupid things. I contacted U UW Press and again, a real surprise, uh, Gwen Walker, who was one of their editors said, oh my God, yes, we're very interested in those interviews. If you could put together a book, we would love to publish it. So I did that. And uh, then things fell into place. Um, really was remarkable. Uh, I asked David Marinus, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and journalist from the Washington Post if he would write the foreword. I knew that he knew Ed Garvey and he said, I'd love to do the foreword, which he did. And then, um, and then we managed to publish the book. And to be honest, it's done far beyond what I ever thought. I, even when I published it, I, didn't not, I did not know if there was really a market for it. I didn't know, I didn't know if people would really wanna read this book. It's basically a question and answer session, but I thought we had some wonderful interviews. There were great revelations in the interviews. I began to realize that Ed Garvey was even more impressive up close than he was from afar. Um, I didn't, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize he played a prominent role in the civil rights movement. I didn't know that at one point in his career, he was actually involved with the CIA. That's a surprising chapter in the book. Ed Garvey worked for the CIA. Uh, uh, let's see what else. And then, um, and then he just uh, he he had so many witty responses to questions that I asked. That um, well, I was very very happy with the finished product, and the book was published in 2019. We had the book launch at Mystery to Me Bookstore. I wasn't sure if five people would show up or 15 or 20. I was shocked when about 70 people showed up and there was a line out the door and book took off. And as I said, it's it's done far beyond what I would have thought. And so actually as a result of that, I'm doing a book right now on another controversial figure who I greatly respect, David Cooper, the former Madison police chief, who's recognized as one of the most progressive police chiefs in US, US history, who quit in the mid 1990s to become an Episcopalian priest. Uh, that book I hope will come out later this year. So uh, on that note, I guess um, the book itself, I'll just give you a, a capsulized version of the book. Garvey and I talked about a number of different subjects uh, from the strike, uh, the uh, protests on the square. We talk about Garvey's early life. He came from Lily White, Burlington, a farming community, very conservative in uh, Southeastern Wisconsin. Went to the University of Wisconsin, got involved with politics. Um, then of course he went to the NFL. There are some incredible stories Garvey tells in the book. Really, um, every every interview I had with him had some new revelation. He talks about his early days with the National Football League Players Union. Ed Garvey was fearless. Another reason I so admired him. He, uh, the NFL owners hated him and he hated them back. And he challenged them all the time. There's a story in the book 
uh, that he talks about how the union was on the verge of collapse in 1970. Um, they didn't have much money. The NFL players were, I mean, the NFL owners were going after them fearlessly. Uh, public opinion in the United States was, you know, let's get rid of this union. It can only mean bad things for pro sports. And uh, Garvey meets with a number of player reps from the union at the Marriott Hotel in 1970. And the NFL owners are applying terrific pressure on owner on the uh, commissioner, Pete Rozelle, to get rid of the union. And at this meeting in Chicago, uh, four player reps from each team showed up. And again, they didn't have much money. And they go around, Garvey goes around the room and asks some of the most famous players in the union, Johnny Unitas from the Baltimore Colts, Daryl LaMonica from the Oakland Raiders, there were several others, whether they should continue the union or not. And a lot of the players like Johnny Unitas said, you know what, we don't need the union, basically he said, uh, it's a distraction. We get paid a fair wage for our abilities, which was true if you were a star quarterback like Johnny Unitas, he got paid a lot of money. But average players, the offensive linemen, defensive linemen, they got nothing, they got peanuts. And lo and behold, in the middle of the meeting, Bart Starr, conservative Republican Bart Starr from, from Alabama steps up and gives a speech talking about how he got paired, paid a, a good wage, but his offensive line, most members of the offensive line did not. Bart Starr talks about how if he didn't have Ken Bowman blocking for him, he wouldn't be Bart Starr. He wouldn't be the all pro quarterback that he is. If he didn't have Forrest Gregg blocking for him in the offensive line or Bob Skaronsky, he would not be the all pro Bart Starr. Anyway, he gives this impassioned speech and Bart Starr ends up saving the union. Uh, I'm just giving you the, like I said, the brief capsulized version of that story, but I was slack jawed when Garvey told me that. I couldn't believe it. And Garvey credits Bart Starr with saving the union at the 11th hour. And um, I think almost every chapter that I had with Garvey, there was some sort of revelation. His hero was Gaylord Nelson. Garvey was first and foremost an environmental crusader and he loved Gaylord Nelson. And of course, Nelson's the father of Earth Day. Um, Garvey has some wonderful stories to tell about his race with Bob Caston. Garvey, if you don't remember that election for the US Senate seat in Wisconsin, Garvey was ahead in the polls with about a week to go. And uh, the Caston campaign ran, ran an ad on TVs claiming that there was $750,000 missing from the NFL players pension fund. And uh, it insinuated that Garvey had stolen the money. Uh, that was the first of Roger Ailes, uh, rotten ads for the Republican Party that steered the Republican Party in that direction. After those ads started running, Garvey fell in the polls like a rock. And by election day, Kasten was ahead. Garvey was bitter about that for the rest of his life. He sued Kasten after the election. He won a libel suit against Kasten, but of course, by then it was too late. Uh, he brought the NFL Players Association, people like Ken Bowman and John Mackey to Madison, and they backed it. Ed Garvey and said, there's no money missing from the pension fund. This is a lie. Garvey almost caught Kasten on the final day of the election, but he lost, I think, by three percentage points. Garvey was not one to hold a grudge, but he held a grudge against Bob Kasten his entire life. Um, so there were all kinds of stories like that in the book. Um, every session that we had, I, um, I came up with the subjects. Garvey had no censorship rights. I told him that what was said in our interviews was ironclad. There was no changing his mind. He actually appreciated that. He did not want, uh, he did not want me to anoint him to saint sainthood. He wanted an objective book about who Ed Garvey was. We, uh, I go into that Garvey did have a hair trigger temper. Uh, I witnessed it a couple times. 
at the end of the book, I asked seven of Garvey's closest friends if they could give me one personal story that about why Ed Garvey stood out from the crowd. And again, much to my surprise, all seven of these individuals gave me stories that, wow, really tell you who Ed Garvey was. Uh, those seven individuals were Dave Zwiefel, who had been the editor of the Capital Times, John Nichols, well-known uh, commentator for the Capital Times, uh, worked for the nation as well. Um, Pat Richter, the former athletic director at the University of Wisconsin, Mark Murphy, Mark Murphy of the Green Bay Packers, president of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, I didn't know if he would be willing to contribute a story. He, he had been a player rep for the Washington Redskins. And, Gar and uh, when Murphy found out I was doing a story on Ed Garvey, he called me and we talked for almost an hour. He loved Ed Garvey, truly respected him. He went to Garvey's funeral. And Mark Murphy told me in the story that that, that is in the book that he thinks Ed Garvey belongs in the NFL Hall of Fame. That's how much he respected him, which is amazing. He's president of the Green Bay Packers and you still have all these NFL owners who despise Ed Garvey. And then uh, there were a few others, Barbara Lawton who had been Garvey's running mate uh, when he ran for governor. Um, she contributes a wonderful story about what our, Ed Garvey was like behind the scenes. So uh, that's the story of the book. Um, I'm happy to open it up to questions right now. Any questions anyone might have? Um, the book continues to do well. And uh, I can honestly say now that I'm, I'm grateful, very grateful to Jim Hermanson for having taken the time to retrieve those emails. I'm grateful to my friends who encouraged me to keep going with this book. And uh, I'm encouraged, I'm uh, grateful to the Garvey family who uh, I was upfront from the very beginning that this was going to be an objective book. I was going to write about Ed Garvey warts and all, and they accepted that. Uh, his wife, Betty, and his daughter, Kathleen, who's an attorney like Ed, they were very gracious and I appreciate their support. And uh, I guess I'll close by saying that people have asked me, okay, if Ed Garvey were still alive, would he be in the shadows or would he be uh, at the fore of this new progressive movement that's sweeping the country. And I can tell you right now, I obviously it's just speculation on my part, but it's too bad Ed Garvey wasn't still around. He would be about 80 years old right now. But boy, he was very sharp when I interviewed him. And if he hadn't come down with Parkinson's, I have no doubt that Ed Garvey would be at the fore of this progressive movement especially in the area of climate change. Ed Garvey, I should point out here, was very close friends with Bernie Sanders. Uh, Ed Garvey started what is known as Fighting Bob Fest in the early 2000s, named after uh, Fighting Bob La Follette, the most influential progressive in US history. Fighting Bob Fest is still held every year. Uh, and, um, Garvey believes that if the Democratic Party is to regain its soul, it needs to it needs to promote a grassroots movement, which we're I think we're seeing right now. We need to uh, we need to elect grassroots politicians at the local level, whether it's treasurer uh, treasurer of the city council or in villages, uh, presidents in the villages, uh, school boards. We need to start from the grassroots and bubble up. The movement needs to bubble up. I think Garvey would be very much involved with voter registration, following in the footsteps of um, Stacey Abrams in Georgia. I think he would be very much involved with voter registration in the Milwaukee area, inner city Milwaukee, especially, as well as areas like uh, Madison and Green Bay and La Crosse and Fox Cities. Uh, and I do think most of all, Ed Garvey felt that special interest corporate money had poisoned the political system and is the reason that the Democratic Party is just a shell of what it used to be, uh, that it's, it's taking money from corporate interests started in the 1980s. We're seeing a change now 
but Garvey, I think, would be working overtime to overturn the Citizens United decision and uh, transform the Democratic Party into the party of the people, which is what it was years ago when Gaylord Nelson was a senator and the governor and when um, Bob Kastenmeyer and William Proxmire were influential Democratic figures, in, uh, not only in the state, but nationwide. So I do think Ed Garvey would relish a role today, and I think he would play a very valuable role. And um, again, I guess I, I uh, feel privileged to have those seven, have had those 17 interviews with him. Uh, he was really among the most fascinating people I met in my 39 years in the news business. And uh, I'm happy I went forward with this book with all the obstacles and hoops I had to go through. So if anyone has any questions at this point. Okay, well, uh, well, Rob, that that is an amazing experience you had having those interviews with him. And we're so grateful that you were able to get those interviews back and write this book. Um, we do have a lot of uh, chat People have said something in the chat, so I don't know if you want me to read those or if you. Uh, want you know, I I see them. Okay, why don't you just and go I can those and, and then we can open it up for discussion. I mean, questions once you go through the chats. Okay, well, uh, Chris Gluick um, said he read the book and enjoyed it. He was a big fan of Ed Garvey, and thank you for the book. and And I I really appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Sally says she shared an office with Ed and Mike Bauer from about 1993 to 1995. Ed was a character. Oh, Ed was, yeah, a character would be putting it lightly. He, he was unlike anyone I knew. And I really do, I really do think that Ed would have been successful as a, a late night TV host. He, he was so quick. Uh, he was brutally sarcastic. Um, he could cross the line occasionally. Mike McCabe, who ran for governor in Wisconsin, tells the story of Garvey had told him that when Garvey was in a debate with Bob Caston right before the debate, Garvey says that he leaned over and asked Caston how his sex life was and that uh, Caston was aghast and uh, didn't know what to say for it. He sputtered for a few moments McCabe says to me, you know, that's who Ed Garvey was. I could never do anything like that. Uh, but I guess it worked. You know, uh, Caston was a little unsettled for a while. Um, so yes, Ed was a character. Um, yeah, he was a big supporter of Bernie Sanders. There's a picture of Bernie and Ed in the book. Uh, he did talk about his relationship with Ed Garvey. Ed, uh, Bernie Sanders was the one one politician that I think uh, Ed identified with the most. They, they agreed on almost every issue. Another one was uh, Paul Wellstein, the former, um, the former senator from, from uh, Minnesota who died in a plane crash tragically, I think in the early 19, or the late 1990s or early 2000s. Uh, Garvey did have great admiration for him, but he and Sanders were like soulmates. And Sanders, uh, Sanders actually attended a number of the Bob Fests, maybe, maybe all of them. And uh, they agreed on almost every issue. And uh, so, yes, they, they, were, they were very close. And, um, and Ed admired him greatly. Um, let's see. Was Garv Ed Garvey's personal book published? No, that's... Uh, that's an amazing thing here. The book that Ed Garvey did on his NFL career was never published. Uh, the reason that I that I that I stopped, you know, that I deleted the emails, thinking that Ed was Garvey coming out with this book on his NFL days, was never published. Um, at my book launch at the Mystery to Me bookstore, a woman came up to me and told me that she was the one who was working with Ed to write that book. But they and she told me they never actually even came close to publishing it. So I was shocked by that. But no, it never was published. 
Um, are Bob Fest and Idea Fest separate items, separate events? Yes, Bob Fest is the one that Garvey started and still is held, I believe, every September. It was held last September at the Barrymore Theater. Idea Fest was started by the Capital Times and uh, it is turning out to be quite popular, but uh, they're, they're not the same event. Uh, I think Garvey would be pleased. A question here from D. What would Garvey think about today's football salaries? I think Garvey would feel validated. Uh, yeah, the average salary in 1974 was $24,000. Uh, the average salary for an NFL player today, I believe the average salary is 2.6 million. So the average salary in the NFL today is 2.6 million. And as Mark Murphy of the Packers told me, that's mostly because of the work that Ed Garvey did. I do think that Ed Garvey did not get his due. I think one of the reasons Ed Garvey wanted to do the book with me was he felt that most people in the United States did not appreciate what he had done with the players union. And uh, I think that hurt him. That hurt him that it wasn't widely known. You know, it would make a great movie. If, if there are any uh, screenwriters out there Looking to do a movie, I think Ed Garvey's career would warrant a terrific movie. Um, Mike Julie, my old colleague at the Green Bay Daily News, writes, "Thanks for being thanks for being on here, Mike." It looks like we lost Rob. Um, it was it was causing some, you know, there was some. Uh, he was freezing up, and I I know that his uh, his computer was um, was plugged in. So, um, boy, he was just starting with his questions too, and it was. I'm just wondering. Um, if he can, hmm. I'm sorry that, you know, this is what happens when you've got tech, technology in the way um, and technology is not always perfect. So I think I'm going to, I wonder if he, he'll come back. Hmm. Can you contact him? Yeah, let me unmute every, uh, can I, can I can call him by cell phone and see if he's able to, oh, that's too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna unmute everybody. Well, it, I think, can, can people unmute themselves? I, I don't know, I, I was gonna unmute you. Let me see if I can call him. Oh boy. Yeah, he was just kidding. <laughs> He was just getting into the, hmm. okay. I was just thinking that while we're waiting for him to come back in, that I think we have a number of folks on here who have some uh, stories of their own experiences with, with Ed. Um, I know Sally mentioned having worked with him for a number of years, and I think there's a few others um, that it might be really interesting to hear people's uh, own experiences. That's a great idea. Do you want to start? No. <laughs> I was just, just thinking about, uh, I got to know him um, starting with the Cran and Mine fight and then later on volunteering with his campaign and uh, through fighting Bob Fest and just, just was kind of recognizing how he was so much more than a politician. What an incredible community organizer he was. And just uh, what a fan fantastic job he did in 
helping folks recognize their own power mm -hmm. um, and just That's getting people to realize how much they could do um, and, you know, how much we got out of that. Um, you know, he built a lot more well beyond just what he did. Um, he inspired a lot of people to do a lot. Um, yeah, that's what I got when I read the book too, that he- I agree, I agree. So he also did some strange things too. Uh, when I was in an office with him and Mike, when they were getting started. And one of the things was, he argued a case in front of the Wisconsin Supreme Court that he really had no idea what the facts were when he argued it. And I went to go to see this because it wasn't like a major case, it was a union case. Uh, I mean, it was in front of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, but watching him be able to basically ad lib an argument, a uh, Supreme Court argument was, was fairly fascinating. Um, I think they knew, I think the just, and Justice Abrahamson was uh, of course on the bench at the time. Um, I think they knew he didn't know a lot about the facts, but they were all very deferential and I don't remember what happened with the case, but again, slightly strange. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. But I agree with Amy. He, he, far beyond, he went far beyond and influenced people far beyond his own circle. And I think that really is important. Well, um, I, we moved here right uh, in, in the early 80s. And um, I heard Ed Garvey's name here and there. And I guess I remember the, when he lost to uh, Governor Thompson. But I had no clue. He was, to me, a well-kept secret. Um, I think this book is just going to, I, you know, it just enlightened me to so much about Wisconsin politics and the background of what happened in Wisconsin for the last five decades, just by learning about what this, what this man did. And what he did with the, um, it, you know, an example of grassroots bringing people together was the Perrier plant when they wanted to Put a perrier plant right near the, the Wisconsin Dells. And um, he, how he organized, and you know, at first there was just a few people that came to the meeting and uh, talking to the perrier rep, and they all said they didn't really want this perrier plant to the bottling plant. And then the, the Perrier rep said, well, this isn't a good representation. We need to have another meeting and get more people. And each time he did that, more and more people showed up and more and, people, more, and more people were against it. And it came to the point where uh, the, the village board, you know, the small little village board, uh, whatever the town was, I don't remember, near the Dells, they had to decide that these, you know, these violent, these, uh, you know, small town politicians had to decide whether or not to get this industry to come and bring jobs. That's what they were saying. And after all of these people, citizens spoke out, the village, the village trustees had nothing. They all they could say was, "We agree with the the citizens." And no, they voted all voted against having Perrier come. And that was a powerful story for me to realize how you know in a democracy how you your voice does count and it's not just voting it's showing up at meetings and we have to start up start at our um you know at the ground at the at our local level the, the the three the three lawsuits that he won in wisconsin his his uh, law firm was just incredible to me that how the power of fighting against Exxon Mobil, Perrier Bottling Company, and the third one was oh a big factory farm in in Greene County. So, um, I think this book should be used. They should use it in high schools for for you know, Wisconsin history classes. You know, I think it's just that that entertaining. And does anybody else have anything more they want to say? I mean, we are we've got about six more minutes, but uh, the this is the library copy, and they are. 
there are copies in the one, you know, the South Central Library system. But um, yeah, of course, you know, every author would like you to have a copy of your own and you can purchase it through UW Press and also I think I'm sure through Amazon. So uh, we encourage you to purchase your own copy if you don't have one. I'm sorry, I guess he never did come back and I don't know if anybody else wants to share an Ed Garvey story. I can unmute or you can unmute yourself, I believe. Um, my name is Mike Julie. Rob and I um, worked together at the Green Bay Daily News. And in when the NFL Players Association went on strike, it must have been, I think it might have been 1974 or 1975. Um, Rob and um, the other sports writer at the paper, John Finkler, um, worked up a pretty good relationship with Ed Garvey. And as a result, this small, this small little paper in Green Bay was breaking all of the major news on the strike because Ed Garvey was, was talking to, um, to Rob and not to the national media. And so I was, my, my question to Rob was going to be, you know, what, how did Ed Garvey remember him from his days of reporting of the NFL Players Association strike? And so I, I'm interested to read the book and, and to see whether or not um, that actually came into play. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Well, um, there are some questions in the chat that were left unanswered and I apologize for that. Um, but I guess you didn't have to read the book to find out uh, <laughs> more of the, uh, it isn't a very, it's an easy read and it was delightful to read. It was just a great book. So um, with that, if there's no one else that has any questions, I will, uh, we will end the, the session. So thank you, Rob, wherever you are. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll have a lot of success with your book and uh, you'll, you'll get all of us excited about, um, you know, getting involved with issues that are important to us. So thank you again all for coming and thank you for the Friends of the Wanake Library who sponsored this program. With that, we will end. Thank you.